Hello, my name is Dr Lisa Whitehouse and I'm from the Law School at the University of Hull and I'd like to take this opportunity to offer you an insight into some of the research um, that I've done in the area of, of property law and particularly land law um, and to go into an area, an issue that I feel passionately about um, and that I've spent most of my career researching in the hope that um, you might find it interesting uh, or possibly that it might help you with your studies in terms of land law, but also that it might just inspire you to go out and do research for yourself in whatever topic you find interesting. So what I'm going to do today, as the title suggests, is offer you a comparison between uh, what we call you know, law in books, so what you might read in your textbooks and what actually happens in practice. And I'm going to use the housing possession process and particularly the mortgage possession process as a case study of that. So the aim today is to offer an account of the mortgage possession process. So this is the idea of uh, people losing their homes mainly because of uh, a failure to pay their mortgage, so because of mortgage arrears. To offer an insight into the advantages and maybe some of the disadvantages of empirical research, I'll go into what I mean by that uh, in a moment. And finally, to uh, evidence the potential for doctrinal accounts of the law, what we might call uh, dry um, or technical accounts of the law, to possibly misrepresent the social and practical significance of legal rules. So that's the aim. Now, my interest in this area, and in particular in undertaking empirical research, began when I was an undergraduate. Um, so as I say, I'm hoping maybe this might uh, encourage you to do something similar. Anyway, so I remember sitting in property law lectures you know, just thinking that some of the legal rules that were being relayed to me by my lecturers didn't seem to reflect the reality of, of my you know, experience. So I was being presented with these legal rules and procedural safeguards for um, homeowners, for mortgagors, that appeared to be you know, a perfectly rational and consistent set of rules. Whereas in reality, the position seemed to be very different. Um, out in the real world, hundreds of thousands of households were losing their homes. So we can see here, and I'm perhaps giving my age away a little bit here, but there we go. Um, so in the early 1990s, we had unprecedented levels of repossessions, as this graph indicates. With In one year, in 1991, there were 75,000 homes repossessed by mortgage lenders in that one year. So this dissonance, if you like, between what I was reading in the textbooks, and what my lecturers were telling me, and what I was seeing in the media and you know, experiencing around me, led me to investigate the practical operation of the mortgage possession process for my PhD. And it's proven a rich source of, of research since then. Now, what I discovered immediately upon seeking further information about the possession process was that there wasn't any information out there, it seemed. Um, the reason for that is that I guess what we might call run of the mill possession cases, just straightforward cases of um, you know, mortgages being in arrears. They're heard in the lower courts. They're held in private and they are seldom reported. So it's what Loveland describes as invisible law. So in order to try and find out more, I had to conduct empirical legal research. But what does that mean? Well, Professor Bryant uh, from Oxford and I have uh, undertaken um, research and publications in this area. And we define empirical research as the use of observable and verifiable data, whether quantitative or qualitative, in order to generate knowledge about law by offering a representative account of how it operates in practice. Now, for me, that meant going out and conducting interviews with a range of key actors, so members of the judiciary, mortgage lenders, regulators, legal practitioners, uh, debt advisors, and so on. And what I'd like to do today is to use some of those findings that I've gathered over the years 
to explore Roscoe Pound's statement from 1910 regarding law in books and law in action and how different the two can be. So let's start by looking at the law in books. OK, so if all you were to do in relation to the mortgage possession process was to read um, textbook chapters, let's say, or just go away and look at the legislation, this is what you would find. OK, now just to give some context to this. In 2019 in England and Wales, there were around 26,000 claims for possession by mortgagees, 24,000 by private landlords and nearly 68,000 by social landlords. And given the times we are currently living in, due to uh, the COVID-19 measures that have been implemented, there have been huge decreases in those actions for both mortgages and landlords uh, this year, so in 2020. And there was a complete cessation of any mortgage repossessions for the five months in the run up to the 23rd of August 2020. Now, possession activity is now resuming um, and so we will have to see what the impact of the pandemic has been on the ability of households to meet their, their mortgage payments and to keep their homes. So we, we will await um, further news and figures on that. Now here I'm going to focus on mortgages, as I say, and the vast majority of those concern mortgage arrears. And in mortgage cases, by virtue of the Administration of Justice Act 1970, Section 36, the court has the discretion to award an outright possession order. Now, typically that's delayed for 28 days to allow the mortgage or to find alternative accommodation or a possession order suspended on specified payment terms or the judge can adjourn the case because they need more information or because forms haven't been filed correctly or whatever it may be. Now, under Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act 1970, the court can suspend possession, so uh, allow the, the occupier to keep their home on payment terms, so provided they pay X amount every month, if it appears to the court that in the event of it exercising its powers, the borrower is likely to be able, within a reasonable period, to pay any sums due under the mortgage. Now, the ability of the, the borrower, the occupier to do that will be dependent to a large extent on the length of time granted by the district judge. So what do we mean by that reasonable period within section 36? Well, case of Cheltenham and Gloucester Building Society versus Norgan held that when assessing a reasonable period, it was appropriate for the court to take account of the remaining term of the mortgage. So what we might call the Norgan calculation, the remaining term of the mortgage. Now there, um, a doctrinal lawyer, anyone looking at that judgment would likely assume that, you know, given the typical length of most first mortgages is 25 years, that in the majority of cases, um, that would give the occupier many years, decades possibly, to pay their arrears and their normal contractual payments. That's what section 36 requires. Any sums due relates to the arrears, so the missed payments, plus their normal contractual payments. Now, if you owe, you know, a thousand pounds in arrears, having 20 years to repay those, that seems perfectly possible, doesn't it? That seems quite reasonable. So that looks quite helpful towards um, the borrower. That's what the doctrinal account would suggest. We'll challenge that in a moment, perhaps. So that's what the, the position is at law for the moment. So that's what section 36 says. Now, enable for the judge to be able to exercise the discretion given to them by section 36, they're going to need information. Now, the occupier can supply that by completing a defence form in advance of the hearing. 
and or they can attend the hearing and tell their story directly to the judge. Now, those who do attend can take advantage of the Housing Possession Court Duty Scheme. Now, while the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, otherwise known as LASPO, has removed several areas from the scope of legal aid, possession actions are still included. So if your home is at immediate risk, you can still get legal aid. Um, and this, in so many ways, this is covered by the Housing Possession Court Duty Scheme. Now, that means that when the occupier attends court, they can get emergency legal advice and representation with possession court schemes typically being run by a local firm of solicitors or a not for profit agency such as citizens advice um, or shelter. So that's a huge boon to to people who may be at risk um, of losing their homes. So when you look at that um, approach, it looks as though an occupier can attend court, obtain meaningful legal representation, tell the judge that they can repay their arrears over a reasonable period over the remaining term of the mortgage and thereby keep their home. Okay, that's what a doctrinal account would suggest. But let's have a look at the reality. Let's have a look at law in action. Now, empirical research into the practice of housing possession reveals that the legal process in practice operates in stark contrast to that portrayed in the books. So, for example, very little time is allocated to these hearings. I'll give you some evidence of that in a moment. The provision of information by occupiers to the judge is relatively scant. Attendance levels are poor. Therefore, the opportunity for duty solicitors to offer occupiers meaningful advice is limited. There's a lack of joined up thinking within the system. And defendants, i.e. occupiers, are often not able to access the reasons for the decision in their case because these cases aren't reported. So let's have a look, let's dig a little deeper into some of those aspects. One of those is the amount of time given to these hearings. Now this is what we call the listing practice within the courts. And the way in which housing possession cases are listed shows that uh, court schedules are very, very crowded. Uh, resources are limited within the courts and that impacts on the ability of judges to take decisions in these cases. Now, housing possession cases are what we call block listed, so that a large number of cases are heard by the judge during a particular session without a specific time allocation. So, you know, the morning session will have 20 cases listed. Some can be dealt with in seconds because nobody's arrived or it's not disputed or whatever it may be, and they'll probably get heard first, while, you know, other people who are attending are waiting in the waiting room, not quite sure when their case is going to be heard. Now, although different courts have different listing practices, um, it means that most cases tend to get allocated around about five minutes each. Now, um, I undertook a study along with Professor Darmy from Middlesex and Professor Bright from Oxford recently into housing possession cases. And our 2017 study found that nine of the 31 cases we looked at took a minute or less to be decided. 26% took between two to four minutes. 35% took between five and nine minutes. And 6% took 10 minutes or more. Now, indeed, decisions regarding loss of home, um, you know, those, those times just seem so short. I mean, just stop and think about it. This is a family's home that's being decided. Will they keep it or will they lose it? That case can be heard in less than a minute. Okay. Now compare that with other, what we might call less significant cases. And this was from a judge that um, we interviewed in 2014, who said, in comparing possession cases, small claims, okay, could be important to the people involved, but you know, not someone's home, not someone's children, and we devote probably a good two hours 
plus to each case, even if it's only for a 35 eBay charge. Now, there's something a bit wrong there. OK, that's coming from a district judge. OK. The next issue relates to the ability of occupiers to exercise voice within this process. Now, the occupier has got a number of opportunities to do that. One is to complete the defence form. The other is to attend the hearing. Now, unfortunately, um, the Ministry of Justice doesn't actually provide any data on the number of defence forms submitted or the number of occupiers who attend the hearing. So this is where empirical research is crucial. Without that, we just wouldn't know. Now, unfortunately, there are only a few studies available and it's just not possible to undertake a kind of nationwide study. So we have to do samples and try and um, derive data and generalisations from that. But in a 2014 study that I conducted with Professor Bright, we found that fewer than 50% of defendants filed the defence form. And in 2017, it was actually fewer than 10% of defence forms. Um, I have to say the 2017 study involved mainly um, uh, social tenants. So there may be a difference there between those and, and mortgagors, but it's indicative of low levels of uh, completion of those forms. In relation to attendance, you know, which, which means that um, that's the real opportunity for occupiers to, to tell their story to the judge. Our 2014 study found that fewer than 50% defendants attended, and the 2017 study found that fewer than 35% of defendants attended. Now, the difficulty there is knowing the reasons for that. Uh, again, you know, this is a really important case. This is people's homes at stake, and yet they're not attending the court hearing. What could be the reasons for that? Well, this is really difficult to find information on. Because trying to talk to people who have uh, been threatened with home loss, who may have lost their home, is very difficult. Uh, anecdotal evidence or evidence um, from others within the system suggest it can be things such as fear and anxiety of going to court. It can be that they've received advice from their mortgage or their landlord, if they're a tenant, which has suggested they don't need to attend that it's a rubber stamping process, that they've agreed that they, they will pay X pounds extra a month and therefore they don't need to go. So there's all kinds of reasons for that non-attendance, but the evidence suggests that participation, that voice uh, is very low within this process. Now this means this information deficit means that judges are unlikely to know much about the defendant's circumstances and therefore decision making becomes very difficult. And as one judge said, we don't get much other than what we elicit by our own questioning, really. The documents aren't going to help us. So the fact that the um, defendant, the occupier, isn't attending makes it impossible for the judge to get the information they need to make an informed decision. Now, the effect of that obviously is worrying. Um, it's not surprising, given the lack of um, attendance and defence forms and so on, that most of these cases end up being adjourned. Um, for that reason, a considerable amount of time and resources for the judiciary, the parties involved, the court staff, is just being spent on cases that aren't being resolved. And that's an issue for justice. That's an issue for procedural fairness also. So there are real concerns here. Now, you know, it may be that housing possession cases are not perceived to involve particularly complex legal rules or processes. You know, the question typically, typically boils down to whether the claim has complied with the necessary procedures and whether the defendant can repay the arrears. That's it. It's a um, if you can pay, you can stay approach with mortgage possession cases. So that may explain why those cases are allocated only a few minutes of court time. But the judge is still obliged during that short time to consider whether to order possession. And, you know, there are questions about how they manage to do that in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. So, again, there are questions arising here about 
the uh, procedural fairness, the due process, whether uh, there is access to justice for, for occupiers. Now, it's not possible in this short talk to go into how we might reform the process. But what I hope that I've given you today is an illustration of how the traditional doctrinal approach has the potential to offer a misrepresentative and misleading account of law. The empirical studies allow us to glimpse into what Loveland refers to the evidential black hole of housing possession cases and the context within which judges have to make these decisions. Now, examining housing possession cases using empirical data can help us to go beyond the anecdotal, often unrepresentative tales of, of good or bad decision making. This is why empirical research can be so crucial to helping our understanding of legal issues. So for that reason, I would encourage you to be inquisitive, to challenge accepted norms and to inform yourself through research. Don't just accept what you are reading in the books. Okay, challenge those assumptions. And if you can, go out and do more research on those topics. What we then do with that research is up to us. What I hope I've done in this presentation is to evidence the value of investing knowledge of the law with an awareness of its practical significance. I hope you found it interesting. Um, I hope you found it informative and I wish you the very best of luck with your studies. Bye for now.